Turn in your Bibles to John in the 11th chapter, and we're going to be looking at a famous story, a story of hope and despair. It's a story that's often preached concerning Jesus of Nazareth. It's the story of friendship. It's the story of Lazarus. Now, Lazarus was the brother of Mary and Martha, famous disciples of Jesus. And they were from the town of Bethany, which is a small, quaint village outside of Jerusalem and not a very far walk from the holy city there. And so this family was very close knit. And it's interesting is that they provided uh, housing and love and hospitality and, and care for Jesus. Remember, Jesus was an itinerant rabbi. And when we say the word itinerant, that means that he traveled from place to place, uh, city to city, village to village, hamlet to hamlet, house to house. That meant that his his sleeping arrangements weren't always established, that he had to have faith from day to day and place to place. His provision wasn't all, always established. He lived uh, by the sustenance of others. People provided for him and took care of him. It was culturally a norm for a teacher, a rabbi, to uh, be blessed by his community and take care of of the community would take care of the physical things because the rabbis and teachers would be taking care of the spiritual things. And so this was the pattern for Jesus. And this one family in particular uh, was taking care of Jesus. And so it's so interesting that Jesus, you know, he heals the widow's son who died. It was the widow of Nain. So he, he has this miraculous part of his ministry. He's healing the blind, the lame, the leper. There's men with withered hands in the synagogues that hands are made right. There are men who are uh, lepers that are completely cleansed head to toe. So this miraculous element is part of the teachings of this particular rabbi from Nazareth. And so you can imagine the frustration of the family, uh, a close personal friend of Jesus, when they're requesting Jesus to come. Jesus, come. Lazarus is sick. They're sending runners and people uh, trying to get Jesus to come. And Jesus won't come. It's a very interesting situation where this family, you can see their frus frustration building up. They're, they're perplexed. Why isn't the Galilean Jesus, who's always been a friend to us, who we've provided for, who we've taken care of, you see how that's a different side of it? It's building up in their hearts. And then to the point where Jesus doesn't come and Lazarus dies. And now... You know, there's starting to be hurt and there's starting to be offense and unbelief. And so those three things begin to fill the heart of that family. Hurt, offense, and unbelief. And I find that those three always run together. Wherever there's a hurt, it can easily lead to an offense and it can easily lead to unbelief. Now, they can work side by side or one can lead to the other. But let's go through the threefold distinction between these two, three. Hurt is when somebody does something to you that's just wrong. That's what hurt is. Of offense is when somebody does, doesn't do what they're supposed to do. That's a difference. You need to understand that. Hurt and offense are not the same thing, and they don't have the same um, reaction to the human heart. They don't have the same 
consequences. You need to understand there's a dis difference and a distinction between hurt and offense. Now, unbelief is a matter of our faith. What we put in place, our absolute trust and reliance. So Mary and Martha are battling these three ugly messengers who've come into the house. Hurt, offense, and unbelief. They send for him again, and he refuses again. And so finally, Jesus says, disciples, I will go. Lazarus is sleeping. What? Lazarus is sleeping. It's an incredible story. It's so interesting to me that why the rabbi would say that he's asleep. It really brings into the question, what is Jesus's view of life and death? And I love that because in a, in a true rabbinical style, you notice Jesus intentionally acts certain ways to create certain situations that will provoke certain questions. Everyone's playing checkers. Jesus is playing chess. He comes on the scene and there's immediate offense in Mary's heart. You remember what she said. Lord, if you would have been here, my brother would not have died. Not only am I mad that you didn't come hurt, you should have come offense. And thank God that Mary had a close enough picture of Jesus that it wasn't to unbelief. You remember how the story goes. Let's read it. Turn in your Bibles to John in the 11th chapter. I love the Gospel of John because we have a unique view of this story. We're going to be starting We're going to be starting Let's start in chapter 11. Now a certain man was sick, Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha. It was that Mary who anointed the Lord with fragrant oil and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore the sister sent to him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. When Jesus heard that he had said this sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and, his, and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that he was sick, he stayed two more days in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to his disciples, let us go to Judea. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, lately the Jews sought to stone you, and again you are going to go there? Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of this world. But if one walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. These things say, he said after that, he said to him, Our friend Lazarus sleeps, that I go to wake him up. Then his disciples said, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get well. However, Jesus spoke of his death, that, that, that they thought that he was speaking about taking rest and sleep. Then Jesus said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead, and I am going for your sakes, that I was not there that you may believe. Let us, nevertheless, let us go to him. Then Thomas, who was called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let us go with him that we may die with him. So when Jesus came, he found that they were already been at the tomb for four days. Lazarus was in the tomb for four days. That's a very important distinction that we'll get to. Now, Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles away. 
And many of the Jews who had joined the women around Martha to comfort them concerning their brethren, their brother. Then Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him. But Mary was sitting in the house. Now Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. Amen. You can see in the hearts of Mary and Martha unbelief, hurt, offense, and yet I want you to notice something that happens in Martha's heart. Jesus is trying to get her to place her faith in himself. And she was placing her faith in a religious teaching. Notice she comes on the scene and he goes, I know that. Then he'll rise again in the resurrection of the dead. That was a Jewish teaching. But Jesus places the object of her faith on the right foundation, which is himself. That is why who Jesus is, is the most important thing. It's in this environment that we get one of the greatest claims of Christ in hurting offended hearts struggling with unbelief the truth rings out I am the resurrection and the life you're dealing every day with hurt people offended people people who have unbelief we're in dark times and dark days, unprecedented times. And the Bible says that in the last days, people will be offended. You've seen this all over the media, even within the last 24 hours in our Texas communities. People are lashing out one side against the other. Mask, no mask, life, pro-life, race, no race. It's just insanity in the last days. Many shall be offended. So you're operating in an environment of hurt and offense and unbelief. And in this environment, Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. It's the truth of this truth, the Christian truth. If you had to sum up the entire Christian message, it's this story. Christ is the resurrection, and the life. This is the point of the gospel of Jesus dying and resurrecting. The reason Jesus died and resurrected was not an event that he did. It is who he is. It's so important to remember, core, essential to who Jesus is. People, people go, well, geez, did Jesus believe did, he, did Jesus raise from the dead? Yes, we know that's true. But why? You have to remember, the why is because that is who he is. He literally is the resurrection. He is life in his very essence. He who has the Son has life. You need to know this, friends. This is the truth. This is how we go against all unbelief is understanding that Jesus is the source of all life. You want to know what eternal life is? It's Jesus. 
Do you know what salvation really is? It's Jesus offering his life to you. That you are joining in to his life. He says, I have come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. Overflowing life. Life emanating out of, out of your heart. You know, it's not just biological life. That word is, is uh, bios. The word for in the New Testament for the life of the Son of Man, the life of Jesus, is, is Zoe. It is, it's, it's more than just simple uh, life animation of, of cells or animals or plants or, or things of that sort. It is life in its truest form. So he couldn't help but resurrect. He is, by his very nature, the resurrection. I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Anytime Jesus asks a question... Always highlight it. Always underline it. The rabbi is trying to help us. Can you just see that story? All the women are weeping. They're angry. They're frustrated. They're grieving. And Jesus wants to go to the tomb. What do you think they're thinking in their minds? Do you think they're having like this heart filled of expectation on what he's going to do? Or do you think that he's going to say some religious prayer and comfort him? I honestly think that they were thinking that Jesus was going to go and pray. And it's even more so because Jesus weeps. Jesus begins to cry. Anytime Jesus begins to cry in the Bible, pay attention. It's important. Verse 34. Where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, see how he loved him. Jesus wept. And some of them said, could not this man who opened the eyes of the blind also keep him from dying? What's that voice right there? That's the voice of the enemy. That's the voice of unbelief. Anytime a voice in the Bible or in your life begins to speak and say, can Jesus do this? It's a voice of unbelief. We have to discipline our hearts and minds to silence the voices that are not of God. You can hear the enemy's voice many times in the gospel story. And it usually casts doubt and unbelief on what Jesus is able to do and who he is. When the enemy speaks, when he speaks to Jesus, are you the son of God? Do this. Are you the son of God? Do this. Make these stones into bread. Throw yourself down from the temple so that everyone would see you. So that you'll be publicly acknowledged. All these things. The enemy always tries to cast doubt on identity and purpose. But Jesus wants to bring life to your identity and life to your purpose. Take away the stone. Now. This is where it's incredible because Jesus is literally helping them understand. He's asking them to participate. Although, although they don't see clearly and although they don't have a perfect understanding that he's the, the resurrection and the life, the rabbi is inviting them to understand through service. The principle of service, it brings forth revelation. Move the stone away. And by serving, they saw the miraculous. By serving, the stone was rolled away. This is the principle throughout the ministry of Jesus. 
The first time Jesus ever reveals his glory is not at the resurrection of Lazarus. Remember, it was at the wedding of Cana. And who saw the water turn into wine? It wasn't the people at the wedding. It was the servants who saw. The servants saw the miracle. The people who are rolling the stone away were the first people to see Lazarus. The Bible says in Revelation in the first chapter, this is the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave to, unto his servant. There are things that you're only going to understand about who Jesus is and what he did through service. When we serve, we put ourselves into a position of a learner. When we serve, we put ourselves in a position to receive revelation from God. There are many things that we aren't, won't be able to understand in the kingdom unless we have a heart and mind of service. So they served, they rolled the stone away, and Jesus' voice speaks out. Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus came out of the grave in clothing, cloth. And this is so important, friends. This is such a lesson. Jesus said to him, loose him and let him go. Loose him and let him go. You see, Lazarus had listened to the voice of Jesus. And, and that voice and life emanated through him. And he rose from the dead. Lazarus was really dead. And he really rose from the dead. But then what, what, he's bound up. He's bound up in the clothing of what? The ceremonial ritualistic clothing of death. I wonder how many Christians Jesus has spoken life in their heart. They're, they're born again. They're alive. But they're bound. They're bound in the clothing of death. This is why Paul says, Reckon yourself dead unto sin and alive unto God. Forgetting the things that were behind. The old man, the old mind, the old carnal mindsets, the old habits, the old way. All of that is dead. For we are crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I live now, I live by faith. You see, all that old mindsets. That old death clothing, that ceremonial bondage is done away with. But sometimes it requires help. Sometimes there's people in our life that are going to help us remove the grave clothes. Discipleship is helping people take off those, uh, loosening those clothing of death. It's taking off that, you know, because you got to remember clothing in the Bible was associated with identity. You could tell who you were, where you were from, and how much money you had and your place of prominence in life by what you wore. So we, our identity is not in the old way, the old thinking the old patterns of sinful behavior, the carnal mind. But in as much as Jesus Christ rose from the dead, now must we walk in the newness of life. There should be a newness. There should be a new life in your life. Your old habits, your old mindsets, we were talking last night, somebody mentioned an old movie that they used to, to, used to, to watch as, before they were a Christian. And they started talking, it's been many years since they've been converted. And they found an old box in their house and they saw all these old movies. And they go, can, can you believe I used to like that? You see, there, if you've been born again, you, you know that there's a newness that comes. A new mind, a new attitude, a new desire, a new taste, a new, it's just new. And so, I, I want us to focus now on, the, on this part of it. 
What do you think Lazarus was like after the fact? You know, that family was struggling with hurt and offense and unbelief. What do you think happened after that? Do you think the voices of hurt and offense and unbelief were loud after that? Or did they constantly go back to that truth of Jesus being the resurrection and the life? You see, this great miracle, this great truth, this great revelation of who Jesus was marked this family. So much so that even when Jesus is killed by the Romans, who's there? Mary and Martha are there. So much so that it was Mary who saw Jesus rise from the dead. She was the first one. And when the voices of doubt and unbelief came again in the garden, because she sees that the stone is rolled away, she's at the garden. They've crucified her Lord. They've laid his body in a rich man's tomb for three days and three nights. It's there. She rises early in the morning to go and she sees that the stone is rolled away. And the first person that she sees, she thinks is a gardener. I find that so interesting. I always wonder, why did she think he was a gardener? She, she sees this man who's, why does she think he's a gardener? I always wonder if, if Jesus was just messing with the flowers at that moment, or, just, or, or he was just messing with the plants, or was he digging around in the dirt? Or, I want us to go back to the very beginning of the entire story of man. You go to the Bible, first book, first story, before Adam, before Eve, at the very beginning, it said that God planted a garden east of Eden. That's what the Bible says. This is how the story starts. You see, the rabbi is playing chess and everyone else is playing checkers. Mary comes on the scene at the resurrection where the story starts. She thinks he's the gardener. It's like bookends in the story. It's beginning and end. It's alpha and it's omega. Garden to garden. What was lost in Eden, Jesus has restored. His resurrection is yours. His empty tomb is yours. He's condemned sin in the flesh. He has defeated death. How does Mary know it's him? The rabbi speaks, Mary. When Mary heard the rabbi's name, excuse me, when Mary heard the rabbi say her name, she knew. Jesus says, my sheep hear my voice. They are known of me and I am known of them. My sheep hear my voice. Have you heard Jesus Say your name. Do you recognize his voice? As the world continuously increases in darkness and hurt and bitterness and unbelief, you need to have a growing sensitivity to the voice of Jesus. I see so many people, and I say this very carefully. They go, 
even in the even in our culture they go well if you talk to your small group leader or have you talked to your pastor or have you talked to your authority and all those things are true and good but what's the first who's first whose voice is the most listened to voice whose voice is loudest because in our society, people are listening to culture and not Christ. And if we're going to be a people that has the power, the dynamic resurrection power to change them, it is because we have listened to the voice of Christ. My sheep know my voice and I'm known by them. They will not follow a stranger. In fact, Jesus tells us how we're going to be saved from deception and following the enemy is sensitivity. To his voice. I was in Israel once and uh, me and my pastor John were there and we were uh, filming for sermons and we were shooting a shepherd in Israel outside of uh, Jordan wilderness. And, and it was funny because the shepherd was calling the sheep and they were all coming to him. And, and, and then John was like, Kyle, you call them. And I was like calling the sheep. Guess how many sheep came to me? Zero, not one. I even tried to give them treats. They wouldn't come. They will not follow a stranger. In dark times, in times of hurt, offense, and unbelief, in times of darkness and ever-increasing religious deception, learn to hear the Savior's voice. Mary, immediately she knew. It was the rabbi. Do you think she ever doubted again? Do you think the voice of hurt and offense and unbelief had any place in her heart and mind when she saw both her brother come back to the life and she saw the rabbi be killed and rise from the dead. Notice now you have to know why Jesus says, hey Mary, don't cling on to me. <laughs> and that's the, that's the proper people, I, you know, think well, was anything inappropriate going on? No, that is the appropriate response when you truly understand who he is. You want to hug him and grab him and hold him, right? If you've ever really had a revelation of who Jesus is, you want to be with him. You want to be around him and talk with him and love him and cherish him. If you know who Jesus is, that's your heart. Mary, don't cling on to me for I have yet to ascend to my father. You now know because Mary knew. And as the Bible says, known, known, fully known. Let's pray. Lord, you said that if we believed, that we would see the glory of God. God, give us a heart like Mary that would believe even in times of absolute darkness times of hurt times of offense times where we feel like you should have worked this way we should feel like you should have provided this way when all of the promises seem to fall flat and there's nothing but darkness around us god help us to believe that you are life, that you are abundant life, that you are the resurrection and the life. And if that we would believe, we would see the glory of God. Lord, help us to have hearts of servants. Lord, so many of these things we'll never understand unless we serve. Help us to serve with good attitudes and good hearts and minds. That we would have a revelation of you. the resurrection and the life. Amen.